This is Lucille. She's a great example of a ball python that I care for. Let me show you how I do it. That was the, that was the cold open. We can probably cut to the logo thing now. <laughs> Welcome to The Green Room, I'm Bob Bledsoe. I think more people are getting ball pythons now than when I last did a care guide probably well over a year ago. So today I wanna to get a little bit more in depth and answer some of the most common questions that I've received since making that original video and maybe get a little bit more specific about some various aspects of snake husbandry. <laughs> You're the snake's husband. You married your snakes. <laughs> because husbandry. I get it. Cool. My brother Kent, everyone, sorry about him. Hello. Do you want to hold Lucille? No, God. Okay, just be the cameraman then, please. Fine. There are a number of categories when talking about the care of a ball python, and in each category, there are a number of ways to do it successfully. I don't argue with people about their way of doing it versus my way, because their way probably works too. But in this video, I'm going to show you how I do it, and I encourage you to look at other people's videos and see their different ways of doing things, um, because you'll get an idea of how you want to do things. Ball python care has changed a lot in the past year and a half or so since I made that video, so this will be all new information. I'm just kidding. It's not. It's going to be a lot of the same stuff but a little bit more in depth. So we're gonna go outside and talk about setup, and then we're gonna come back in here and discuss feeding, and then I'm gonna cover some of the most common questions that I get, and also go over some beginner questions that the Green Room Python's Patreon community came up with. So there's a lot going on in this episode. Let's cut to a few days ago when I was losing my voice and went outside to talk about how to set up an enclosure. All right, some of you watching this are experienced keepers and you don't really need this information and you're probably watching the video just because you support the channel and I really appreciate that. Most of you watching are going to be new to ball pythons and you're probably considering getting a ball python. You may have heard that it's a good beginner species. I don't think any exotic animal is a good beginner species. But you you have to begin somewhere, right? You've got to start with, with something to get experience. Um, you can make up for lack of experience though with a ton of research. And I think it's important to be as much of an expert as possible in the species that you're getting before you get it because these are not disposable animals. Like that's what beginner species means. To me, it's it's kind of a, a different way of saying, ah, it's disposable, you can try a few and eventually you'll get it right. But this is an animal that depends on you for their, for their life. So doing a ton of research is the difference between being a responsible pet keeper and being somebody who just gets a snake and throws it in a fish tank and feeds it the wrong size rat. So well done doing your research. We're outside today mainly so that you can hear the airplanes go by and the crows in the trees, but also because this is gonna be my enclosure. We're not gonna go over the big debate of glass versus tubs versus PVC. So we're just gonna use this as the enclosure. When I set up a new enclosure, I am thinking about type, size. I'm thinking about heat, humidity, enrichment, substrate, what else? Did I say hides and security? I don't know. I don't know what I said. Hides and security, enrichment. Anyway, we're going to go over these things. I'll make sure that I cover them all. We'll go over them. All right. Enclosure size is a big debate. And again, I'm going to tell you how I keep my animals. But regardless of what you do, you could keep them in a V70 tub and somebody goes, V70, I keep mine in a four by two by two. You're abusing your animals. And somebody else comes in and says, four by two by two, I keep mine in a six by 10 by eight. You're abusing your animals. Six by 10 by eight, I've moved out of my house and into the garage so that my snake can have my entire home. You're abusing your animals. Pay no attention to those people on Facebook. Uh, figure out what you wanna do as far as the size of your enclosure. I'm gonna tell you what I go by. I generally say that the snake should not be any longer than one length plus one end of the enclosure. Now, uh, the, way, the reason that I say in general is because snakes are all individuals and you'll find some that'll do really well in an enclosure that's much bigger than that. You'll find some that do really well in an enclosure that's smaller than that, especially the young ones. A really young ball python sometimes likes to be in a much smaller enclosure. Not always. So you're gonna sort of figure out what works for your snake based on whether they're eating and whether they're doing natural behaviors, things like that. If you're just bringing your snake home, you wanna put them on paper. And that's because 
you want to be able to see any snake mites coming off of them. We're not talking about quarantine today. That's a separate video. Uh, but at least for 30 days, that's about the life cycle of a potential um, snake mite egg that might be on your snake all the way up until adult where you could actually see them wandering around. So you want them on paper to start out with. This is gonna make it difficult for humidity, especially if you live in a dry area. But for 30 days, it's probably okay. Just spray a little bit in the corner. You don't have to douse the whole thing, but have a big water bowl, spray a little bit in the corner occasionally, and um, you can manage your humidity that way for 30 days. After 30 days, you can use substrate. You can change out your paper. And there are a number of substrates to go with. I'm just going to tell you what I use so that this video isn't four hours long because each of these subjects could be their own video and they have been. I have videos on all these things. But let's talk about uh, wind. No, let's talk about substrate. After 30 days, I'm using chip. This can be Repta chip or Cocoa Block or whatever you want. This is going to keep my humidity. This is what I'm going to mix water into to control my humidity. Sometimes for me, if I mix a little bit too much, the humidity is going to spike way up there. So I've got to, you've got to figure out a, a happy medium of how much water to put in, but I'm not spraying the enclosure. I'm mixing it in. If you spray the enclosure, all that water is going to evaporate right away. If you mix it into the cocoa block or, or uh, cocoa husk, you'll have good humidity for like a week or so. Depends on where you're at and what your, what your dryness or humidity is in, in your general area. But uh, in general, mix it into the cocoa block and you'll have good humidity for a while. On the subject of humidity, I'm measuring it with a Govi hygrometer thermometer. This one, the battery's dead, so you're not seeing it display anything. But uh, this is what I'm measuring it in, in each of my enclosures pretty much. I mean, you can sometimes tell visually, you know, that your humidity is okay, but I like to keep my snakes between um, like 65 and 80. That's kind of a big um, range, but that's generally where they're at. They're usually probably closer to 70 uh, most of the time and between 80 and 90 when they're in shed. Some people say 50% humidity for ball pythons because if you look at the weather in uh, West Africa, the humidity is about 50%. But keep in mind that the humidity and the temperature where the snake is underground in a den is the temperature is lower and the humidity is higher than, uh, than what it would be outside. So checking the weather in the area that the snake is from is not a good way for any type of snake not a good way to figure out how you should keep them. Humidity does not cause respiratory infections, by the way. Bacteria does and viruses do. Humidity could uh, exacerbate it. If you, have a, if you have a dirty enclosure, a dirty, humid enclosure could cause a problem, but a clean, humid enclosure is no problem. By the way, this, this, I use, this is a thermometer, hygrometer, but I don't worry about the temperature as much on, on this because I'm measuring my temps with a temp gun. You need one of these. This is what's gonna measure your surface temperatures at your warm end versus your, your cool end. Since I mentioned a clean enclosure, let's really quick take a little detour and talk about spot cleaning uh, before moving on to the rest of the setup. What I do to spot clean is, you know, I'm looking each day, usually a couple times a day, for poop or urates, and uh, I'm taking a towel. This, this is a bucket that I, uh, this is called green wipe and you can get this on Amazon. You can get the bucket and dry wipes with nothing on them. I mix up F10, watch this. I mix up F10 SC and put it in here and I have F10 wipes. So I also have F10 spray bottle mixed up here because I'll, I'll spray and use paper towels too. But I use these F10 wipes a lot. You just grab a handful of, of whatever and, and all the substrate around it especially if it's, if it's urates, because uh, you're gonna have chick, chips that's soaked in urine. So you're gonna grab all that and toss it. That's pretty much how you spot clean. Now, urates will stick to the bottom of the enclosure like cement. So you either use a plastic scraper like this one that my buddy Shane at Evergreen State Reptiles gave me, or you use a spoon. This I use occasionally for the really tough ones that plastic won't even get up. And I've written snake on it because I don't ever want to confuse this with a soup spoon. So you get your urates up, you use, you know, however you want to use wipes, but, but you can also 
just spraying F10 and using a paper towel works really well too. I just like to have the wipe, I th it, it works well, but I use both, I, I double up on it. I'll, I'll use the wipes to pick up everything and I'll kind of wipe around and then I'll spray the area and clean it off. I'm pretty good at spot cleaning, so I do full changes of my tubs every four to six weeks. If I wasn't very good at spot cleaning or I wasn't very confident in my abilities to get all that up, I would probably do full changes more frequently. Now, we're not talking about bioactive. That's a different video. All right, we've talked about substrate and humidity. We took a detour to talk about cleaning. Now let's talk about heat because this confuses a lot of people. Here's the situation. Let's say our warm side is gonna be here. You need a heat gradient for ball pythons. So they need to, uh, um, because they are cold-blooded, they have to thermoregulate. So you need a warm side of, let's say, 90 degrees on the warm side and 80 degrees on the cool side. Generally, if your house is a normal range of, I don't know, what do people keep their houses at? I keep mine a little warm at 76 to 78. Some people keep it at 73. But a lot of times, if you're good on your warm side, your cool side will be fine. You'll be somewhere around 80. I don't mind my snakes to be a couple degrees cooler than the standard of 90 and 80. I have some of my snakes at like 88 on the warm side and I don't, I try not to get below 88. You know, 76 is fine on the cool side. It's not for everybody. It's just sort of how it works out because I have some of mine in racks and, and the racks heat differently based on the levels. But the ones that are on the cooler end do just fine that are, that are like 88 hot side, 76 cool side. It's just fine for them. They digest their food and they, they do everything just fine. Here's how this works. We're gonna go over this quickly. You're gonna take a heat pad and you're gonna stick it under your enclosure. Not, not there, that's not where it goes. Not under the substrate, under your enclosure. Now, if you have a PVC enclosure, you're not gonna use a heat mat. You'll use overhead uh, heating. We'll talk about that in a second. But for tubs and glass, you're gonna take this heat mat and stick it underneath. It's gotta be on a thermostat. You have to use a thermostat. I think some new people hear the word thermostat and they go, I don't understand that at all. I'm just not gonna use one because I don't get it. It's imperative and it's pretty easy to, to figure out. I'm gonna give you a brief explanation of it. This is your thermostat. Your heat mat doesn't plug into the wall. It plugs into the thermostat and the thermostat plugs into the wall. This is the thing, I'm gonna plug this into the wall. This is what's running the heat mat now instead of the wall. If I plugged my heat mat into the wall, it's just gonna get hotter and hotter and hotter and burn your snake and kill it, okay? so. Uh, this is going to control how hot this gets. I have nothing to plug it into, but basically I'm going to set this to whatever temperature. Okay, so I've got this. Hold on. Let's get our probe. So this has a pro Oh, I'm standing on the probe. Uh, this thermostat has a probe attached to it. This is the probe. And it's got to be sitting on the heat mat. I think I have tape here. With You can take some foil tape or really it doesn't... I mean, it should be foil tape just because this will stay sticky. And and you stick, probably don't stick it on the metal part of the probe. I stick it right behind on the wire part. So you're sticking the probe to the heat mat. The probe goes right into, it's already attached to this thermostat. There are different types of thermostats, by the way. There are, there are much more expensive ones. This is a cheap one. Uh, called BN Link, it works just fine. So for one enclosure, this is great. You don't need like a Herbstat or, or a Vivarium Electronics if you just have one enclosure. You stick that on your heat mat. Your heat mat with the probe on top of it goes under your enclosure. The, for a setup like this, the probe should not go on the substrate. Some people do this and they go, oh, it works fine. It does work fine until your snake dislodges this and then your heat mat uh, just heats up and heats up and heats up because this is not reading the probe. I mean, it's reading the probe, but the probe is no longer on your heat mat. So it just continues to heat. So you don't want any chance of this dislodging. So put it on the heat mat. And then you're gonna set your probe. This is this is a question that, that I see all the time. People people don't understand. They're like, oh, if the, so the heat needs to be at 90, so I gotta set it at 90. And then they're confused because it's only 86 inside their enclosure. The point is, inside the enclosure needs to be 90. I don't care what this is set at. Whatever it needs to be set at to get this to 90 is, is where it needs to be. And that's where my heat gun comes in. I'm gonna take my heat gun after a few hours. I've, I'm setting all this up before I get my snake. I'm gonna take my heat gun 
and I'm gonna temp gun this, not on the substrate. I'm gonna pull it away, pull the substrate away, and temp gun on the glass or on the plastic, whatever you're using. And that should read somewhere around 88 to 90. If, you, if it does, you're good. I don't care if this has to be set at 96 for this to read 88 to 90 and, and be consistent. Or this might need to be set at 86 to read 90. It depends on, on the situation. I have some that I have to set lower than 90 for it to actually be 90. And I have some that have to be set higher than 90 to read 90. So uh, set this wherever it needs to be. Your temp gun at the surface is the important number. Okay, hides are really important. Actual snake hides. Now, it doesn't have to be a snake hide that, that was made by a snake hide maker company. You can get a pack of these at the dollar store and just cut holes in them and put them in your enclosure. These are food containers that I just cut holes in. And a snake that fits in a hide this size is gonna outgrow this really quick, so don't spend a ton of money on these. But here's the deal with these hides. Snakes need to feel secure. And a lot of people come home from the pet store with a ball python and they've got one of those half round logs. Imagine if you were playing hide and seek and you chose to hide in, in one of those pop-up uh, garage dome things that, that people put in their driveway. It's like to keep the rain off of their car, but it's all the way wide open on one side, all the way on the other. And you're just standing there hiding in one of those. It's not a hide. You can see all the way out one end, all the way out the other end, and you know that everyone can see you, can see you also. So that is a piece of enrichment for snakes. Those are great for enrichment, but it's not a hide at all. So that's not even one hide. That's zero hides. <laughs> and that could go somewhere in the middle, but you need hides. The snake can enter into this part of, of the hide and curl up underneath, and he can't see out. The snake can't see out, and if he can't see you, then from his perspective, you can't see him either. You need something that, they, that, that covers them. So it could be that. These are also at the dollar store. Not even one of them for a dollar, like five or six for a dollar. Okay, so those, these things are fine. These guys are fine like this. Uh, and, and you want this to be a hide that's the right size. Like this, this would not really be a hatchling hide. In fact, I didn't even bring a hatchling hide out. A hatchling hide are the other end of these food containers that's about half this size, okay? And then as they grow, I'll put them in this or in this. This is for a pretty young ball python. And then um, eventually they'll go to these hides right here. And then they'll, they'll get bigger even, but this, is, this hide they'll be in for like, I don't know, they'll probably fit in here for a year to a year and a half before they graduate to to probably just one size larger. And then if you get one size larger than this, then you're buying buckets at the dollar store, like full size buckets and cutting holes in, in the buckets. But the point is you, you want to give them two hides that are exactly the same because they, snakes prefer security over thermoregulation. They don't, they, their number one concern is security. Um, and when I say snakes, I'm talking specifically about ball pythons, different species are a little bit different, but ball pythons, pretty much their number one thing on their mind is, am I secure and am I safe? If they, if you have two different hides, I realize these are two different sizes, but I wanna do this for the example. If I have this hide and this hide, and my snake likes this hide because he just barely fits in it, and this one's a little bit too big, then it doesn't matter that this is on the cool side. He's gonna stay in this one, even though he needs to digest his food and be on the warm side, he's gonna stay over here because he prefers the security. So if I give him two hides that are exactly the same, he, he doesn't have an option to, to you know, the, he, he's gonna like these the same and he'll thermoregulate. Enrichment, give them a bunch of things to crawl around on and explore, especially a young snake, give them a bunch of enrichment. Give them, have some logs, have a bunch of different things so that you can, you know, you don't have to give them all this stuff. Let's say I give them this and this, and then next time I go to, to do a full clean out, I'm gonna take their enrichment and I'm gonna change them. I'm gonna give them this thing right here and these plants or whatever. So it's changing because eventually that skull thing that you got for inside the tank that your snake crawls through the eye holes of, they're gonna get bored of it after 30 days. 
and eventually they'll get stuck in it. So uh, don't use skulls for one thing. And um, you know, this stuff, cha change it out every, you know, every so often so that they, they have new stuff to keep their mind active. Because they will, you will see their mind working. By the way, I know that there are some people that'll watch this video and go, "Oh, snakes don't think. They're they don't. They're, it's just a snake. Why does it matter?" But if you give them something new, one new item in their enclosure, throw your heat gun in there and just watch what your snake does when they come out of their hide. They will inspect this all over the place. That is their mind working. So give them new things to have their mind work. Don't keep your heat gun inside the enclosure. So give them some cool things to crawl around on. Don't, uh, don't give them anything they're gonna get stuck in. And then you need a water bowl. Let's give them some water. Give them a water bowl that they can't dump. I use, this is a, this is a cereal bowl and I do use this for, for water for my snakes. But most of the ones that I get are those, those little white ceramic ramekins. You just don't want a bowl that tapers like this one. Like imagine a bowl this shape, a snake is gonna squeeze their body around it and pick it up and it'll dump. So just have something that they can't dump. Another question that I see posted a lot is, do you have to filter your water? Do you have to use bottled water for your snakes? It's up to you and, and where you live. Um, a big, you know, what, what I always see is somebody says, oh, do I have to use filtered water? And then some people will respond, snakes live outside. They don't, they drink out of the stream. They don't drink filtered water. That's a great point, but streams aren't filled with chemicals and chlorine and things like that either. So if I had a stream running through my backyard with clean stream water, totally would use that. No problem. I live in Burbank. I can taste chlorine in my water. So I filter, I just have a pitcher. And so I filter my snake's water because I drink filtered water. So I would just give my snakes whatever I drink. If you drink from the tap, give your snakes tap water. That, that water is probably fine to drink. Um, keep in mind that your snakes are gonna have a more sensitive system than you with regard to chemicals in the water, chlorine, things like that. So, uh, you know, if you can taste chlorine, you probably should use filtered water. Don't use distilled water. Distilled water removes everything, minerals, all kinds of stuff that, that you want your animal to have and you wanna have also when you, when you drink water. And you don't need bottled water. You don't have to pay for bottled water. Just get a, just get a pitcher that, that will filter your water and change the filter regularly. Speaking of changing, I change out my waters every three days. Um, some people go a week because there's a lot of, of people who have way more snakes than I have. Uh, so changing every three days is kind of a big deal. So they'll go once a week, something like that. I find though that, that my snakes do fine with every three days. If I went to once a week, I have a few snakes that as soon as I change the water, they'll go and start drinking. And to me, that means if I give them fresh water and I s visually see them like waiting for that fresh water so they can take a drink, that means that, that I waited too long to change their water. So give them fresh water uh, as often as you can. If you have one snake and you wanna change their water every day, do it. I clean out the bowl every time. I either, I, either, I kind of sw switch off. I will um, use Dawn dish soap and clean out the, the bowl or I use F10 and just sanitize the bowl and give them new water. All right, this snake is set up. We're pretending that it has walls and a, and a ceiling. So let me say one more thing before we go back inside to talk about other stuff. I mentioned when we were talking about heat that you're not gonna use a heat mat on a PVC enclosure. And that's because the PVC generally is too thick for the heat mat to go through. Uh, so all you do is use overhead heat for that. So, so you can use a, um, a CHE, you can use a, a overhead, like a heat emitter. I forget what you call it, but I, I have one in my in my PVC enclosure for my Super Dwarf. Those are usually options that the builder of those enclosures will give you uh, to do an overhead. This is another thing, big debate. Ball pythons don't need belly heat. They don't have belly heat in the wild. They just have heat and giving them a nice warm side is just fine. If I have heat, this, this was a question that somebody asked me recently and it's a good question. If I have heat on this, you know, my, my snake is gonna be in his warm side enclosure and my heat comes from the top, it's not necessarily gonna heat under the, the hide as well as it's heating around the hide. But this goes back to me being okay with my snake at 88. If this, I haven't tested what it is, I should test it and see. But if I have heat coming down at 90 degrees on top of the hide, 
he's not going to be any less than 88 under here. They're going to be just fine. So, um, and they also could come out and bask, especially if the heat is on at night. That's another debate as to whether you really need heat at night. You probably don't, but my snakes all keep keep their heat on at night. Uh, but don't worry about that. Just if, if you need, if you can't use a heat mat because you've got a PVC, do the overhead, have it hitting at 90 and they'll be just fine. All right, let's go back inside. Okay, feeding. Now this is a big topic. Wait, Kent's Corner. Do you have a Kent's Corner? Yes. Like a good one? Because this is a long video and we don't have time for nonsense. It's not nonsense. Why would you even think that I would? Fine, let's roll a Kent's Corner. Hi, and welcome to Kent's Corner, where every episode is the best. Today, since my brother keeps talking about snake husbandry, I wrote him some vows so that he can marry his snakes and be their husband since he loves them so much. I, Bob Bledsoe, nope. promise- We're not doing that. Dang it. Sorry, folks. Okay, feeding. I'm gonna go over some basics, but I'm not gonna cover everything here because I've already done a couple of feeding videos and I'll probably do more. So here's how I do it, basically. I feed frozen thawed rats and mice, depending on what that particular snake wants to eat. I have one snake who eats mostly mice. I've only gotten her to take a rat a couple of times, and uh, she does just fine on them. So this is a snake that's, that is on mice most of the time. She's a pretty big, pretty big girl. Mice are almost as nutritionally dense as rats, and um, snakes do just fine on them. That's a big misconception, and you'll hear a lot of people argue that uh, mice are like feeding Twinkies to a child. Not true. They're pretty, very close to rats. Rats are better, in my opinion, because they have a little bit more nutrition and um, you only have to feed one. Whereas when I'm feeding uh, Lucille here, she ends up taking two to three jumbo mice instead of just one small to medium rat. Feeding multiple mice instead of one rat is more expensive, but they do just fine on them. All right, feeding intervals. This isn't a breeding video, so I'm gonna talk about non-breeding snakes. And also I'm talking about my snakes. Uh, so, and this is one thing that everybody does differently. Hatchlings get fed a meal that is about 10 to 15% of their body weight every five days. Um, only until I'm sure that they're well started though. You, because really these snakes, even out of the egg, they could be fed once a week. It doesn't have to be every five days, but I like to do that to make sure that they get used to eating. So that's maybe their first six to eight meals, maybe 10 meals, something like that. It's going to be different for different snakes. So then I, I pretty quickly move them to a once a week schedule. You know, I say 10 to 15% of their body weight. You could weigh your snake and weigh the prey item and do 10 to 15%. I'm usually eyeballing it more than weighing, but uh, especially when they get beyond those first handful of meals, I'm just kind of going with a rodent that's about as round as the thickest part of the snake's body. Somewhere around maybe 700 grams. Uh, they can move to every 10 to 14 days, but this always depends on the individual snake for me. I don't, I don't feed all my snakes exactly the same. Sometimes most of their feedings end up on the same day and that's convenient for me to do but I feed the snakes based on what I feel they need. So at 700 grams or so, they can move to 10 to 14 days. Once they have a bit of size on them, it's totally okay for them to skip a meal. I mean, it's okay for them to skip a meal, even if they're, you know, this is a normal, this is not a fat snake. This is a normal snake. She can totally skip a meal. And she often chooses to, don't you? And she does just fine. If the snake's in shed, I might offer a meal, but I have no problem with them skipping meals occasionally and especially when they're in shed they don't need to eat so i'll offer and if they like to eat if they're a snake that likes to eat when they're in shed then i'll give them food uh, if not no big deal now for adult snakes i'm not even measuring the thickness of the body versus rodent size anymore or i don't measure that anyway i eyeball it but um the my, my rule for the adults is males don't get anything bigger than a small and big females don't get anything bigger than a medium I'm talking about rats, by the way, you guys, smalls versus mediums. Lucille obviously is different. She's an adult, but she's getting mice, so she gets a few jumbo mice. I'm about to go over common questions that I hear from first time snake owners. I asked my Patreon community to help out with some ideas and they came up with some really good ones. So I appreciate their input on this. This scroll is uh, a list of some of the good folks in a couple of the tiers of my Patreon. They get exclusive content, sticker packs, Green Room Python's t-shirts, all kinds of extra stuff, uh, the ability to participate when I need some help with a video. 
And I think I'm going to start doing Patreon-only live streams. So let me know what you think about that idea. Anyway, thanks so much to the Patreon supporters. Really appreciate your help. You guys are keeping this channel going. So I decided to pull out Molly Malone for the question section. The way that I'm choosing my co-hosts today is that yesterday was feeding day. So the couple of snakes that did not take their meals get to be my co-host today. Keep that in mind. Just because somebody is doing a care guide on how to care for ball pythons on the internet doesn't mean that everything always goes 100% swimmingly for them. We still struggle with occasional non-eaters. She's doing good though. She's, she's a good body condition. She eats enough. You eat enough, don't you? You just don't eat every time I feed you. All right, let's do questions. Here we go. One of the questions that I get a lot is, I got my snake yesterday and he pooped. Can I lift the hide to clean it or is that gonna stress him out too much? Keep in mind that the rules, I know it's it's tough when you're, when you're just learning about a species to know what rules are like hard and fast rules and what rules you can kind of bend a little bit. Um, uh, so, yeah, the, the short answer is yes, you can lift the hide. You can totally clean around your snake. The idea is that you don't want to be, for that first week, you don't want to be pulling the snake out and like handling them and messing with them all the time. You just want to give them time to adjust to their enclosure. But absolutely, you can pick that hide up to check on your snake. You can clean around them. If you have to move your snake, I don't mean pick them up and play with them. I mean, just scoot your snake over to to do some spot cleaning, that's totally fine to do. Do I really have to wait a week to handle them? Yeah, if, if you're a new keeper, I would say give it a week. It depends on your snake. But if you're not really familiar with snake body language and you can't tell if a snake is stressed or comfortable, um, you might just wait the week. Just use that general rule. How often do I handle my hatchling snake and for how long? I, you know, my what, what I usually start out with is once a day, 10 to 15 minutes might go, might move that to twice a day, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the snake, depending on their body language, such like that. But again, if you're not super familiar yet with snake body language, if this is like your only snake, um, or maybe you have a couple and you're still getting used to snake body language, just use that general rule, 10 to 15 minutes once a day. And, and then obviously not right after they ate, you know, not, not a day or two after they ate and not while they're in shed. I fed my snake and he hasn't pooped. Does he need surgery? When is he gonna die? I'm, I'm kidding on the last part. Uh, not, they're not asking about surgery or death, but people are very concerned that, that they feed their snake and then they don't see them poop. Uh, snakes poop on their own terms and it is not that often. Some snakes will, will poop a couple days after they eat, especially younger ones tend, tend to do that more often. They'll, they'll eat and then a couple days later you'll see a poop. More often though, they hold it for a long time. Some poop once a month, some wait until they shed. So uh, don't worry about it. They'll be just fine. They just take a while. I fed my snake and he hasn't shed yet. Is he going to explode? Again, the explosion part was my add-on. Uh, snakes shed, let's say that growing, young growing snakes shed about every six weeks. But again, every snake is individual and every snake is different. So you can expect them to shed about every six weeks. But I, I have heard this a couple times that uh, on, on Facebook posts that people think that when they feed their snake, it will shed its skin each time. And that is not a thing. But don't worry, your snake shed will shed when it sheds, just like poop. Should I move my snake into a separate enclosure to feed it? Nope, no, no need for that, don't do that. How do I know if a snake is about to strike slash how do I gain confidence in handling my snake? That's a whole separate video, but a snake that is about to strike, they always say the neck is in an S position. The problem is a snake is an S shaped animal. So when are they not about to strike, right? So, so the idea is, laying in a, in a, however they're laying in a coil or however they're, they're in their enclosure, right? Neck is in an S position. Yes. But a tense S position with their head trained on you. Okay. Or trained on whatever they're about to strike, like their food and, and their head is going to be up a little bit, but it's going to be a very tense thing. It's not, it's not like sitting here, relaxed like this. This is an S position, right? But she's not about to strike. So we're talking neck, this part that's going into my beard, uh, in a tense, tight S position with the head up. That, that means that they're potentially going to strike, maybe bluff strike, maybe they won't, but they're, they're thinking about it. Um, and gaining confidence, again, 
that this is a whole separate video, but gaining confidence with handling your snake um, is, is all about just doing it. You know, going in there and I would say, pretend like you're, a, if you're not confident, fake it till you make it. Pretend like you're confident, go in, confidently pick up your snake from behind. I have some videos on how to do that and do it regularly because with regular handling, your snake will get used to you and you will get used to your snake. If you're a little bit nervous about snakes and you bought one, I don't know why you bought one if you're scared of them, but uh, the, <laughs> the way a lot of people do this, um, the way you get over your fear is just by handling them and, and also realizing that if they do bite you, it's so not a problem, you guys. If you have a bird, a bird is gonna cause so much more damage than a ball python. Like there's just hardly any damage at all. It's going to startle you because they strike fast, uh, but they're not very likely to strike for one thing, most ball pythons. And uh, she's going in my shirt. They are, they are likely to undo the button in your shirt. Do I need a misting system? Nope, you don't. Don't mist your snakes. Don't, uh, your ball pythons. I say snakes and, and I mean ball python. Don't mist your ball pythons. Definitely don't have a misting system that's a breeding ground for bacteria and your ball python. Not only do they not need to be misted, they also don't need to have a respiratory infection from the bacteria that your misting system uh, produces. So no need for that. So as I said, some of my Patreon supporters gave me uh, some of those some of those questions, and Chelsea over on Patreon gave me a good phrase that helped her when she was a new keeper. Somebody said, "A bad keeper wouldn't be so obsessed and worried about their animal's health and happiness." So I see that a lot, where people are like, "Oh, I feel like such a bad keeper. I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I don't. This happened, or I don't understand this, and I feel like I'm being a bad keeper." Don't worry. The fact that you're worried about it, you're not a bad keeper. Okay. Um, I, I would say this though, that it's, and I've mentioned it before, specifically talking about Facebook, there are a lot of trolls on Facebook. And the, the really unfortunate thing is that somebody who's kind of, it's swimming in their head, like, oh, I'm so worried about my snake. I love my snake so much and I don't want to be a bad keeper. You'll run into a troll on Facebook that's like, you're abusing your animals. I can't believe you're, you know, just don't listen to that. Pay, pay no attention. Maybe maybe don't be on those Facebook groups if you're if you're running into a lot of that stuff because you can get a lot of good information uh, elsewhere. You can also get a lot of good information on Facebook, but it's mixed with so much bad and so much troll behavior uh, for some reason. I don't know why. I don't want to dissect it, but that's my uh, that's my little soapbox on that. So let me know what additional questions you have if you're a new keeper and I'll try to address them in a future video or maybe a live stream. And I know a lot of you are experienced keepers, so feel free to drop your advice in the comments section too. A lot of people go through and read those comments. Um, I do, I always answer all the comments. So, um, you know, put your comments down. I appreciate your likes. I appreciate you subscribing to the channel and making those comments and such because that is uh, that gives the channel a lot of support. So with that being said, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next week. Molly Malone, you did so well. You're such a good co-host. You know what good co-hosts do? They eat their dinner. <laughs>